Welcome to Off Duty, I'm Kelsey Hubbard. Well, I'm sure you don't want me to remind you, but tomorrow is tax day, everyone's favorite day on the calendar. But it isn't all bad. Smart Money's Kelly Grant found a few businesses who are using the excuse of tax day to offer their customers a few freebies. There's plenty to hate about tax day, especially if you procrastinated or you owe Uncle Sam a big check. But if you're a glass half full person like me, well, there's plenty to love about tax day too. I'm Kelly Grant for Smart Money, and here are some of the tax day deals that are up for grabs. Just showing up at Maggie Moo's or Marble Slab Creamery in the evening on April 17th gets you a free scoop of yogurt. At Cinnabon, it's two free cinnamon roll bites. Here at Chevy's, you'll get two margaritas for 1040, not to be confused with your form 1040, and they're picking up the tax on your meal. At AMC Theaters, you can get a principal coupon for a free small popcorn. It's not all food. The Hydro Massage chain has printable coupons for a free massage in its high-tech beds. And if you're a last-minute filer, some Office Depot locations will make copies of your return for free and shred up to five pounds of the uh, evidence in paperwork or other files. But claiming some tax day deals can be a little bit taxing. Not all locations participate. Some deals are good only for a short window of, say, 4 to 7 p.m., and most are while supplies last. The bottom line is call ahead and arrive early, and make sure those tax returns land in your mailbox first. Now, money may be the last thing most of us want to think about, unless you're planning on getting a good return from Uncle Sam. Either way, let's check in with Robert Frank for this week's Money Talks. One of the new phenomenons that we've seen with the wealthy is a group I call the high beta rich. We used to have the millionaire next door, which was the sort of smart, humble dry cleaner down the street that had saved and not spent any money for years and earned a million dollars in savings. We're now in an age of sudden wealth and sudden wealth loss. And the short story is that wealth today does not bring security. You can be worth a hundred million dollars, even in some cases a billion dollars. There's a couple named Timothy Driblixith who were worth 1.2 billion dollars. They were on the Forbes list, one of America's richest couples in the mid-2000s. Idra now filed for Chapter 7 liquidation bankruptcy. So she's at zero. So we are now in an age when people can go from a fortune of a billion dollars to zero. And the reasons this can happen is because of what's happened in financial markets. Financial markets today go all over the place. They're incredibly volatile. We have more and more people that rely on debt for their wealth and their lives. You know, so many of us, including our government, were borrowing to maintain the lifestyle that we had. So when you had these assets that were inflated in the bubble, decline in value, plus you had all this borrowing, then you had these huge fortunes that could suddenly crash. And what it all means is that for some people, wealth no longer brings security. You know, I think many of our lives, we assume if I make $100 million or $20 million, if I just reach that magic number, all my problems will go away and I'll have stability. I won't have to worry about money. The truth is, no matter what you're worth, you still have to worry about money. In fact, I would argue the wealthier you become, the more time you spend worrying about that money because there's more to worry about and there are more problems at that level than when there's a lower level. So the, the age of high beta wealth means that wealth no longer guarantees security and that there are things that we have to do in our life, like make sure we have enough cash, make sure we lower our debt, make sure we lower our spending to brace ourselves and defend ourselves against the forces of our high beta economy. If you're a movie buff and live in New York City, the Tribeca Film Festival starts this week. It'll be the place to see big releases and under the radar indies. For a preview of it all, we turn to Speakeasy's Alexandra Cini. So Alexandra, the Tribeca Film Festival starts Wednesday. Uh, this is a festival that's really sort of unlike a lot of other festivals, but it's very New York. It got its roots after 9-11. Tell us how it got started. Well, Robert De Niro was one of the co-founders and he really came together with a group of people to revitalize downtown Manhattan. So this festival is different from other festivals because it is a public festival. There are 50 world premieres, 89 films in total. So more than half the films have never been seen before. The two tent poles, the two really big budget films, are the five-year engagement, which is opening the festival, and the Avengers, which is closing the festival. Everyone from the Avengers is going to be here. So you're going to have that big 
event, everyone from the five-year engagement is going to be here, so you're going to have that. Woo! <laughs> Come on, it's so nice. Do it. Whoa! Oh! What? Ah, what? My hip, my hip. Oh, my God. I landed on some... Oh, it's a fire hydrant. What is a fire hydrant oh, doing there? Poor old Grandpa. Oh, God. Oh. Did you just say my hip, my yes, hip, my did. hip? But let's do a head count here. Your brother, the demigod, a super soldier, living legend, who kind of lives up to the legend, a man with breathtaking anger management issues, a couple of master assassins, and you, big fella, you've managed to piss off every single one of them. That was the plan. So these are huge, obviously big yes. box office films, yes. Avengers, of course. Uh, everyone's been seeing all the press and then the trailers coming out. But there's also a mix of more, uh, you know, I guess, indie or smaller films that are going to be here. Is that very much by design? Absolutely. You, I, I was talking to Jeff Gilmore, and one of the things that he said is he actually, about a dozen films from the studios, he passed over to take some of these indie films, to take some of these smaller films, because you want to cull talent from places that you may not have. Just in this year, the festival yes. is actually a little bit different than it's been in years past. Yes. Tell us how. Well, the director of programming left after many, many years, and they kind of moved people around and also brought on new people. So you've got a lot of people with a lot of years from many different film festivals kind of converging on Tribeca to make sure it comes together. Well, I'm excited for, there's a film called Broke, and it's about what happens when athletes go broke, which you know, financially is very possible. Now, there's also one here that um, I know you described to me as sort of the Downton Abbey crowd yes. might, might enjoy, which uh, I count myself in that group. So it's called Cheerful Weather for the Wedding. Yes, and that's exactly what it is. That's how it was pitched to me. You want to make sure that you have people who are excited to come for the Avengers, but you also want people who, you know, may be of a different taste right. and someone who can come for a costume drama. Some people are sold on that. So it's about getting enough of the public interested in enough their variety, right. but at the same time showcasing something new. And access to these films for the average everyday person on the street, how easy is it? How, how difficult? You can get a $8 ticket to any general screening. They have them every night starting Wednesday going through April 29th. You just have to you know, look at the schedule because it is a little crazy. One thing we like to do here at Off Duty is bring you creative people and odd jobs. Speaking of odd jobs, how would you like to run a dog business in Alaska? Hmm, I wonder if you could put professional musher on your tax return. My name is Kathy Leninger, and I have a business called Sled Dog Adventures, and I give sled dog rides, tours, extended expeditions overnight, so I have a mushing school, anything to do with sled dogs. I have over 20 dogs and I probably have about eight sleds. And what I do is I, I can take out two people at a time if they want to go for a ride. We do everything from half hour rides to hour, um, two, three hour. Um, I have overnight trips where I teach people how to drive their own dog team. And then we'll go off on a camping trip. We might go 20 miles and set up camp. This is Ace and he's five years old. He's one of my bigger dogs. He and his brother are about 65 pounds, which is large, but he's incredibly strong and he can pull a heavy load. I put him in the wheel, uh, which is the position right in front of the sled. I'm always carrying weight. And those dogs, the wheel dogs have the brunt of the weight. He's Alaskan Husky. They're northern breeds with different kinds of dogs right in for speed. Um, a lot of them have hound in them. He has hounds somewhere in his background, uh, and but for the most part, he doesn't have a thick coat, he, a really thick coat. He's not big and bulky. This dog can do, he can run 12 mile, 10, 12 miles an hour. He can trot that, and he can do it all day. He can do 100 miles a day, you know, when he's trained to do that. They eat high quality dog food, uh, but I like to get a lot of meat in there too, so I will buy things like ground up chicken, um, I actually fished for 26 years for salmon for them. Um, when people have horses that die, they give them to me, I cut them up. Anything. <laughs> Once I get them lined up, um, then I have a break, I have a hook, we take off, and I have my voice uh, to, to tell us where to go. 
it's all voice commands. Uh, the way I deal with my dogs is that I'm, I'm the top dog. I don't ask them to do something, I tell them. I, I, I don't beat them, but I'm very firm with them. But I also give them a lot of love too. In 1980, I was in the Wrangell Mountains and I was driving, I was in a, staying at a remote cabin with a friend. Uh, it was 52 below out, I took, the, I took a team out, I took our team out, and I was going across a small lake that I had always gone across. All of a sudden, my dogs were in the water swimming, and then I went in. And it happened so quickly, I was shocked. And I remember thinking how warm the water felt as compared to 52 below Fahrenheit. <clears throat> so fortunately, the dogs were able to crawl up onto the ice. I don't know if it was a warm spring. I don't know what, why we went through, but I grabbed the bottom of the sled and they pulled me out. I was wearing a heavy sheepskin uh, parka, bunny boots. I doubt if I could have gotten out on my own. So I'm here because my dogs pulled me out. <laughs> it's a great relationship. We, you know, we rely on each other. Thanks for watching Off Duty. I'm Kelsey Hubbard. Don't forget to click above to subscribe and keep going to WSJ's channel on YouTube. We'll see you here tomorrow.